So thank you everyone for having me here. I'm just the mere patient or perhaps guinea pig in this scenario, albeit a successful one thanks to Rod Hicks and his team. Um, technically, I'm going to get things, I'm sure I'm going to screw up, and there's a lot of people here that can probably tell me I've said the wrong thing. But I can tell you that I have a grade two net. My first KI 67 score was a seven. It's now due to my last uh, reading, I think it's a five. During the initial uh, period, my CGA scores ran between 160 to just a bit over 300 for the first three years. And since the PRT, they've been pretty consistently high. They're all sitting around about the 240 to 250 mark. So that's my technical speak for the whole session. Um, but the topic is a little bit um, provocative, but Rod's only got himself to blame because he gave me the, the headline. But in the next 10 or so minutes, I hope to um, actually demonstrate that I'm one of the lucky ones because I've come through the, the PRT, albeit it took time. Um, during this, I'll also hopefully identify some of the and highlight some of the different perspectives that come into play, and especially the importance of getting on the right team, as I would say, getting to the right people. Cancer is, in many respects, a physical one because you suffer symptoms. For net sufferers, it's, it's flushes, diarrhoea, vomiting, etc. I'm sure you're all aware of that. But for me, in many cases, but also from all the patients we've seen in the support groups, it's very much a mental one. You know, they've got to deal with this and a huge amount of uncertainty, especially with where they may be. Um, nets being nets, it's a very individual thing. So it's, it, it really deals, treats different people in different ways, and whether they come in early diagnose or late diagnose, it's a big deal. And then when they do get to find something from a doctor or a specialist, the facts are, are given to the patient in either terms they don't understand, um, it's not explained completely or not accurately to them, or in case of one of my original teams, the doctor didn't have a frigging idea and was just bullshitting his way through the discussion. So that's, that's the bad team. <laughs> um, in Australia, as it is in the world, I'm sure you know that being in the right place has a big play in the whole theme. And in Australia, at least, oh, I'm lucky. I'm in Australia, I'm in Victoria, and eventually I got referred to the A team at the Peter Mac Centre. So just an, another bit of a brief history on, um, on my disease. I was luckily diagnosed after um, collapsing one evening on the floor as a result of kidney stones, it turned out. Rushed to an emergen rushed to emergency. Um, eventually, after three or four hours of the wonders of morphine, I got to have a CT scan at about 4.30 in the morning. My first stroke of luck is that the intern that was doing my scan on his last rotation actually went out of his way and just didn't look to see the obvious kidney stone. He saw that there was something else shimmering in the background. My next stroke of luck was that his mentor was the leading Monash University uh, surgeon in uh, stomach surgery and an endocrinologist. And he happened to ring him up first thing in the morning and said, I've got this guy in here and I've got something, can we have a bit of a look? And then he came back and informed me, yes, we need to do something. So Monday I get the call from the specialist, um, you know, going to go for another CT scan. So that was Tuesday. Wednesday morning, he calls me back and say, I think you urgently need to come in and have a discussion. And Thursday morning, I'm in having a right hemicolectomy. So it's a pretty vast turnaround in four days. But then the good news got even better because we had a positive uh, pathology result that I got then only seven days later. So seven days, all of a sudden, I find that I've got a carcinoid net. So now my journey begins. So that's interesting because I'm, I haven't got a team yet, but we get assigned a team, and that is when my first five months of frustration begins. Because we get nominated for a group that, seriously, they have a great history in dealing with cancer. Um, the guy's got a head start. He's got a positive pathology result in that he knows it's a net. He's not dealing with a patient that has all these symptoms and he couldn't misdiagnose it. Um, he's had experience before with other net patients. He actually has some. So he actually, we think, should have a bit of an idea about what he's going to be doing. But eventually we find that that's not the case. And seven CT scans in five weeks, I think uh, three 
uh, brain scans as well at Royal Melbourne and a number of other x-rays, we find that, no, I don't really know what to do, but let's go down the, let's go down the surgery path. So in the next few months, I get prepared and on this path to do liver surgery with a leading liver surgeon and teacher from Monash again, which is great. But three days from the surgery, I get told I'm not going to have it because it seems it's not the right way, it's not viable. The liver surgeon had sh sh told the team nearly two months beforehand. I learned three days beforehand, and I'd also been mentally prepared because I'd also had a VATS procedure to remove a lump about two inches from the side of my heart as a lead-in to get prepared for this thing. So we're there, now I'm not in a very good place because we really don't have a surgery option. This guy has no idea what to do. And the family's getting a bit concerned. So my wife uh, even got a bit more angry because he, wouldn't ret he started not to return our phone calls. So we took the offensive and said, well, I think it's about time you referred to somebody that actually might have an idea. We, we've got a letter written to Peter Mack, to Dr. Michael, and guess what? We finally got assigned to the A team. So are we thinking that our cards are, are fall in the right place? And you know, is there a real way forward here? So again, I'm Australian, I'm Victorian, I'm now with Peter Mack, one of the world's best teams to have on your side with this. Surely I've got all the right ducks in a row to move forward. <clears throat> so, I'm not going to talk much to these, but the first slide and the very left-hand one is my very first uh, PET scan when I just joined the team at Peter Mac. Um, it's from a technical view, I'm sure you can tell me a lot more, but I can tell you it's easy, it's, the disease is prevalent. You know, it's reasonably there. I've got a reasonably good uptake of GAT8. Um, and there's mass, but probably not enough from a technical viewpoint to do anything with it. That's the message from a technical viewpoint. But what's the, what do I get told? Well, I get told, sorry, you're not sick enough. You have to wait. Um, you're not really in the scheme of, you're not in the priority in the scheme of things because there's more patients either sicker or whatever and that actually have to come in front of you. So it's a bit of a, a, bit of a conundrum there. Well, what's sick enough? Why do I have to wait? How long do I have to wait? And what's this going to do to me over that time? So it's a bit of a concerning period. But this is where Peter Mack stepped up again and two weeks later on my birthday, we have a two hour session with Tim Akers, one of Rod's team members. And he spends two hours with us. And he takes an extreme amount of time to lay out in layman's terms, and in some cases technical terms, why we have to wait. What is the effect of this disease? What's it going to do over, to me over time? What is the treatment? Because this is the treatment you're going to get. And then what is going to be the result of that treatment? So he's taken that care and given us the why in, in extreme detail. That was probably the most important, informative, and interactive sharing of information that I've had the benefit of, and something that I want you to think about. Sharing that information. Give them the why. Give them that explanation that they need. The next three pictures just clearly just show the progression over time. Um, yep, a few more dots. Um, the symptoms started to grow. I undertook um, Sando injections, so I started at uh, 20, 30, two lots of 20 for 40s, and then I was in 60s, so that was a fun time. But, you know, I, I was coping with that. But I didn't sit around and do nothing. That's when I got the benefit of being introduced to the Unicorn Foundation. So in 2011, I went along to my first patient group, and I was then lucky enough to find out that I wasn't really in a bad way. Yeah, I've got disease, and my, my scans actually show that they're worse than a lot of those other patients. But I was actually relatively asymptomatic. Right? I'm a pretty fit and healthy guy. I recovered from my right hem hemicolectomy. I was out of hospital in nine days. So I'm pretty fit and healthy. But a lot of other patients really suffered through that period. So it was you know, difficult through the journey of attending the patient sessions to see people getting sick and I'm gradually getting sick, but they're getting treatments in front of me. So it's, again, playing on that mental thing. Um, I also started more work with the Unicorn Foundation, uh, became a board member, 
I also uh, did a, the inaugural Victorian um, Cycle to Conquer Cancer, where I raised personally just over $20,000 for the Peter Mack Foundation to, for their funding. Um, but then from a, from a personal perspective, I was in a high-stress job. So that was not helping the whole symptom piece as well. So um, that was causing some of the on increase in the symptoms, especially a bit of the flushing, a bit, a bit more of the diarrhoea, and, and et cetera. So um, the sand injections helped, but you know, it just got me on, on an even keel. But then finally, finally, in to late 2013, I'm sick enough now to get treatment. Woohoo! It's pretty good, eh? So that, they then tell me, and to the day, it's three years, two months, and eight days from my initial conversation at Peter Mac to then getting treatment. Three years. During that time, at, during the patient sessions, I can't count the number of people that had jumped the queue, should we say. I also, unfortunately, can count the number of patients that had died during that period. So here's the next point, which is my, my scan two months after my initial PRRT therapy in November. So I had my last treatment, my four rounds, and I had the last, uh, the, the scan there in November. Um, by the magic number crunching that uh, Tim was able to tell me, I had an 88% reduction in mass of tumours, which to me is a pretty impressive thing. And the other uh, scans there show the um, annual scans. I'm doing six monthly PET scans, but they're the annual 12 monthly scans since. So here I am now, two years post PRT, but guess what? I'm back on that weight cycle again because I've got that steady thing. Now I know from all discussions, and Paul Rod, being a board member, he gets pestered by me for all sorts of questions when he turns up for a board meeting. <coughs> I know there's a lot of technical reasons for this delay, but I'm the lucky one because I've got this access. Your patients don't have that access. You need to keep giving them that communication as to why something is happening, what is that pathway, and how can they move forward. Interestingly, my access to this conference has given me a couple more questions, um, especially based on um, Ben's discussion of genomics and his uh, talk about, well, how do these things mutate and then what's the treatment? So who's to say, as we know, that the treatment for these residual or maybe new growing um, tumours will be the right one for me? That's an interesting question. The other one that I found was, well, there seems to be this recommendation that there should be some biopsies done on these tumours to actually figure them out and figure the right way forward. I can tell you in the two years since, that hasn't been offered to me either. So guess what? The team's going to get that question next time I go there in two months' time. <coughs> so information, tell them, speak to them. I'll point you to, the, to our, these are two webinars that Unicorn Foundation have prepared. Unfortunately, they both have me in it, so just tolerate that. The first one's just generally about how patients, uh, different patients are dealing with it. The second one is actually me undergoing my PRT. I volunteered to be the, the video guinea pig, and through the whole process, uh, Dr. Michael Hoffman is there administering the, the actual drug to me. Mark and the team are, and are lucky um, side actors in the whole show, but it actually went through the process. It's there to educate the patients, the future patients. It's had a, just under 900 views on YouTube, but I would please encourage you to give, get these links to your patients to help them understand. I think we're a world leader, the Unicorn Foundation, in this sort of information sharing. Now, I cannot express the thanks of Simone and Unicorn and the family for all that help. It's been a six year journey, but I'm lucky because I have this access to the information. A lot of your people don't. We see people come to the thing and they're advanced disease. They're really suffering. You know, I'm asymptomatic, so healthy, I'm so lucky. I've coped with all these problems. And I get out there and I still run it off and do what I need to do. You've got to get 
this help you to get them that information. So <clears throat> if I can make a couple of clear points here is that you need to get that information, you need to explain, you need to tell them the why. Why is this happening? What is the approach? What is the pathway for me? And I know it's a, it's a net and it's variant. So please, spend that more time on that why. Direct your patients to the support groups. And to the first point, as hard as it is, despite the doom and gloom, be as positive as possible because your demeanour will rub off on them. You know? And that mental thing comes into play. They have to go through the journey, even though you do. And I understand you deal with this all the time, and it must be so hard to deal with such a debilitating thing, not just if it's cancer or even if some other disease, right? But we have to show that compassion and help and explain the why. And importantly, because you see I'm a bit of a Peanuts fan, never give up. As stupid as Charlie Brown is, he keeps going after that football, and Lucy will always pull it apart. But you never give up in hope, right? Thank you. Well, we thank you so much for your time and you. uh, for you to share your experience with all of us today. I think it's really, really invaluable. Um, I do agree that communication really is the key uh, between all the medical professionals as well as um, you know, patient and families. And it's really good for us, I think, for all of us here to, to hear it from your perspective. I think it's been very, very helpful, actually. Thank you. Are there any burning questions on the floor? Otherwise, we'll move on to the next speaker. Thank you very much for your time, Paul.